meeting recording. And I will start off by welcoming everyone to this August collaboration team meeting um, as part of IARPIC. So just as a reminder, today is a joint collaboration team meeting. So we're excited to have members from the Atmosphere Modeling and Arctic Observing Systems join us today. Um, we'll get into some details about today's meeting in just a second, but there's a few, uh, few housekeeping things to take care of first. Um, so just a couple of technical notes. Um, this meeting is being recorded um, and there will be recording available within a week, um, hopefully sooner after the end, and uh, that will be available on YouTube. Um, the link for this our YouTube channel is in the notes of the agenda today. Um, please remain muted. We will have plenty of time for um, questions and discussions um, at the end of today's meeting. And before we get started, I just want to highlight that IARPIC has a new um, code of, relatively new code of conduct, which I am going to put into the chat for your reference. Um, there we go. And so I'm just going to read out the blurb just so that we all can remember that IARPIC is first and foremost a community space and that the IARPIC Secretariat is a, uh, and the community is committed to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion is particularly committed to supporting the inclusion of historically minoritized groups in Arctic research and to address the historical and ongoing impacts of colonization in Arctic research. Um, IARPIC collaboration strives to create an inclusive, constructive sp space for sharing information about research, science, and knowledge co-production in the Arctic. So if you have any questions about um, this code of conduct, please let uh, me, um, I'm a member of the IARPIC Secretariat now, and I'd be happy to answer any of those. Um, either later on in the meeting or after. Um, so right now we can just do a quick roll call. If you can place your name, your uh, affiliation, and if this is your first collab um, collaboration team meeting into the chat, uh, that'd be great. Let's us see who is joining today and also welcome new members. And while everyone's doing that, I will hand it over to Richard, who's going to introduce the topic for today and our speaker. Hello, um, I'm Richard Cullither with the NASA GMAO and I'm the modeling subteam co-lead. Um, so I'm gonna say a few words about IARPIC. IARPIC is a means to document and facilitate coordination of Arctic research among the various agencies of the US government. So there's a set of collaborative teams that facilitate discussion and provide, communi and provide communication on various initiatives and progress towards performance elements of the federal Arctic research plan. And we invite participation from researchers, stakeholders, and other interested parties. Um, there are no specific comments from any of the collaboration teams, and we have quite a few collaboration teams here. I'm part of the, the modeling uh, sub-team. We have the uh, atmospheric observing sub-team as well, and this is the time, normal meeting time period, I believe, for the atmospheric uh, collaboration team as well. So, so we have a lot of collaboration teams who are meeting today for, the, for this topic. Okay, so let's just go on to the uh, today's uh, topic. So there was a discussion in the development of the next five-year IARPIC plan that focused on you know, the issues about how modeling and observations can work together. Um, but in fact, um, there is something that is fundamental to that. The blending of observations and modeling is defined as an analysis or a reanalysis. Um, so that's the correction of a short-term numerical weather prediction forecast to observations. And this is a fundamental tool that is used for a variety of purposes. And analysis is um, essentially the primary purpose is for initial conditions for a numerical weather prediction forecast, but it's also used for a variety of climate assessment studies. So frequently observations are used to improve the model side of the analysis through um, the improvement of parameterizations, um, also the assessment uh, in an assimilation system of, of how the model is being corrected towards observations. But today we're going to uh, reverse that. We're going to hear about how models can be used to improve observations. Uh, that go into the analysis, or at least assess them. And this is through the OSSEs. Um, so for me, it's always great to hear from a colleague uh, from my building, from my section, uh, uh, for an IARPIC presentation. And today we have 
uh, Nikki Prive from the NASA Global Modeling and Assimilation Office and at, at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center um, and Morgan State University. Um, and she'll be presenting on OSSEs. All right, so I guess that's me now. Yes. Um, hi, I'm I'm Nikki. Let me share my slides here. So, let's see, slide share. So everybody can see the uh, slide here now. Yes, we can. Excellent. So, what I'm going to give here today is going to be just a a brief overview of. Aussies. I'm going to be talking mostly about numerical weather prediction Aussies. There are a couple of different flavors of Aussies, um, such as like climate Aussies for, for looking at observations when you want to look for climate signals instead of for numerical weather prediction. But there's a lot of overlap in how you perform Aussies between the different types of Aussies. So this is going to be a brief overview. And then afterwards, we can go into more detail if anybody has specific questions about different aspects of this. See, excellent. So, first, um, Richard already already started addressing this, but a quick overview to numerical weather prediction and how it uses observations. So, I have blatantly stolen this lovely image uh, from a paper by um, William Lehas uh, and Scheider, which I highly recommend um, from 2014, which is kind of a review paper on um, performing OSSEs in general. Um, so, what we do here is we're trying to combine some prior guess about the state of the atmosphere. Um, usually this prior guess is a forecast from an earlier time. Uh, it could be six hours ago, it could be 12 hours ago. Those are standard lengths that you would see in numerical weather prediction, could be longer depending on, on what you're doing. So we have this previous guess, this forecast of what we think the, the atmosphere is like now. And then we have a whole lot of observations. Um, in a normal uh, operational system, we might have millions of observations every day. There are really quite a few observations. So we take our forecast, we take our observations, and we use data assimilation to squish them together with math. So basically data assimilation gets really complicated, but it's kind of a glorified averaged weighting process. So when we're, when we're trying to combine the observations and the forecast, what we're looking at is how much do we trust the observations and how much do we trust the forecast? Maybe we really, really trust Ray Obbs, Ray Winsons, because we, we know that they're really good. And then we might have a satellite and perhaps one of the channels in that satellite has been acting a little funny lately and we don't trust it very much at all. And then we look at our, our background, our forecast and say, well, how much do we trust this forecast? Do we think it's really good? Maybe we think it's really good in some areas and it's not so great in other areas. So we assign um, error values to all the different observation types and to our forecast. And we use that when we wait and combine these two together. So the end result from this is an analysis. Um, and the analysis is the best estimation of the current state of the atmosphere once you combine the observations and the forecast together. So when you're running a numerical weather prediction system, this is an iterative process. You make an analysis. That analysis is the uh, initial conditions for your next forecast. You run the forecast. You use the next forecast time with a new set of observations that come in to make another analysis. And you wash, rinse, and repeat. This is usually what we call cycling. So what is an OSSE, an observing system simulation experiment? A traditional numerical weather prediction OSSE is a modeling experiment that you use when you want to estimate the impact of a new proposed observing system on numerical weather prediction when you do not have any actual observational data. Um, maybe you're just in the early design stage of a new instrument and you, you don't have anything. Maybe you just have a little bit of, of test data, but you don't have a full suite of data. So in order to do this, you need to simulate everything. You start by replacing the real atmosphere with a long free model run, which we usually call the nature run. And this, this model run becomes your new atmosphere, your new truth. And then we say, okay, well, if we had all of the current observing systems and they were observing the nature run, what would they see? So we simulate 
observations of radiance types of aircraft of Raywind sand of ships and buoys and everything that normally goes into an operational system we kind of back out from the nature run fields as if the nature run itself was being observed by these instruments each of these are called synthetic observations for some reason so when you make these observations they're usually too good right you knew exactly what the nature run was and you've used some kind of operator on them to to make these observations usually as form of interpolation um, and they're they're usually pretty good and we know that real observations are not as good so you need because the data simulation uh, relies critically on what the error characteristics are of your observations you need to add simulated errors onto your simulated observations so that your object your simulated observations have um, real statistically realistic error characteristics in order to get the kind of behavior out of your experiments that is going to be robustly informing you about what real observations would, would, would look like. So you want to do this not just for the new data type that you're interested uh, in, in experimenting with, but also with all of the data types that are currently used in operational system, all of the conventional types, the radiance types, uh, radio occultation, you know, anything that you would normally use in your forecasting system, you want to, you want to simulate. Um, so then we take this nice set of simulated observations and we, we pretend exactly like they're just like real data and we treat them exactly like real data. So we ingest them with a data simulation system into preferably a different operational model. And then we perform this cycling where you're ingesting the data, you're making a forecast, you're ingesting more data, you're making another forecast, more analyses, more forecasts. Um, and this is where you can run your experiments um, in this new system. And because you simulated everything, you can simulate whatever you want. Um, so this is kind of a very sophisticated and somewhat ex computationally expensive toy where you can play all kinds of different games, looking at different characteristics of how these, these observations are made and how they perform in a system that has a lot of the characteristics of the real world, um, but it's not the real world. So we do have a little uh, diagram here. So in our little diagram here, the top uh, flow chart is showing what happens with real forecasts and the bottom flow chart is with Aussies. So in the Aussie, we've replaced reality with a nature run. Instead of directly observing reality, we generally interpolate um, and use an observation operator to make our synthetic data. And after that, the rest of the system is basically the same. Uh, one crucial difference is that in the real world, we don't actually know the true state of the real world. The closest thing we have to the true state of the real world is the analysis. And the analysis um, is influenced by the observations themselves. So it can be very difficult um, to judge how good that analysis is. And also with short-term forecast, how good those forecasts are. In the Aussie, we don't have this problem because we know everything there is to know about the truth because we made the truth. The truth is the nature run. So we can calculate directly the analysis error, the forecast error at short times, we can look and see precisely how these observations are behaving in our system in ways that are just not possible with real data. So why would you want to do an Aussie? Aussies are a lot of work. This is a lot of, there's a lot of simulation. Um, it's it's can take years to get one of these going if you're starting from scratch. So why would you want to do this? The most common use, uh, the traditional use here is what I've already described, where you have some new observing system and you want to say, well, is this is this worth investing in? You know, what benefit am I going to see if I launch this new satellite? Um, but it can also be used if you're interested in making design decisions. You know, how should I scan with my new satellite? How often do I need to take this data? What configuration of orbit is best for me? Can I, I'm interested in maybe saving some money or some power requirements by making this change to the instrument. What effect does that have? These are all things that you can test relatively easily um, in most cases in the Aussie. Um, it's just the expense of running model experiments. Um, and also, it can be a powerful tool when you want to look at how the data simulation system itself is working because you have that ability to directly calculate the analysis error and how the observations are actually working in the ways that are not possible with real data. Um, you can look very closely at um, some aspects of, of how your data simulation system is behaving and work out, you know, you can look for problems 
and try to optimize how how that's behaving um, in the system, provided that you think you've done a good enough job with your entire simulation of everything up to this point. So it is very important that you validate your system <laughs> um, as much as possible, because since everything is simulated, it can be easy to uh, make a mistake somewhere. So you, you do want to double check as much as possible that your observations are realistic, that your nature run is realistic as you're going along. So briefly about the nature runs, um, for global Aussies, uh, what has generally happened is there have been these community nature runs where one institution will make a nature run. These can be very large. Um, several petabytes currently is the size range for a large global nature run that might have a two-year length. Um, ECMWF has made um, two or three nature runs over the years. Uh, this image here is a GMAO, a NASA product, the GS5 nature run that was made about six or seven years ago. This happens to be an image of Patel's potential vorticity, which was the only Arctic image I could find easily um, for you here. So the thing with nature runs is you do want to be sure that um, the processes that you're interested in looking at are realistically represented in the nature run. Um, and I'll get into a little detail about Arctic processes that are a particular concern with, with some of these nature runs. Um, if you were interested in doing a regional nature run, um, these are doing a full-blown regional nature run is actually about three or four times more work than doing a global nature run. Uh, to do one in the proper manner, um, you need to make a global nature run and then embed a regional nature run inside of the global nature run to take the boundary conditions from the global nature run. Um, and this is much more laborious than running just a global nature run. Um, if you don't do this, if you do a, a what we would call a quick Aussie, where you're doing a regional nature run, but it is not embedded in another Aussie, it might be embedded in a, in a short forecast um, using real data, um, you're limited by how long you can, you can make your nature run to usually a few days um, because of the issue of boundary conditions coming in from, from outside. All right, your simulated observations. The goal with your simulated observations um, is to st have a statistical spatial temporal distribution of the observations that are realistic and to have uh, error characteristics that are statistically realistic. So let's say that you, in this case, I've put a picture here of some atmospheric motion vectors. Uh, the top is some real data um, from 2015 and the bottom is a set of simulated data from Manasi that we had at GMAO. And basically, if you took a bunch of different dates of AMV observations and you made a plot like this and you put them on the table and then you took a couple similar dates from the Aussie and you mixed them in, ideally you wouldn't be able to tell which one was simulated and which one was real. Um, they shouldn't be perfectly matching. In this case, the AMVs are, are dependent on where the clouds are and where the clouds are in the nature run is not the same place as where the clouds are in the real world. So we don't expect a perfect match, even though they have nominally the same date. Um, but the distribution overall should, should be similar. And that's actually can be fairly tricky. So since everything is simulated in your Aussie, how can you trust the results? One, when you're going along, this really should be validated. Um, validating your nature run, validating your simulated observations, validating the behavior of the data simulation system. Um, and, and making changes as necessary to match as best you can. It's never going to be perfect, um, but to match as best you can the behavior in your Aussie, the behavior of the real world. If you've done that work of validation, then um, you will understand the strengths and the weaknesses of your Aussie system and be able to say how robust you think your results are. Um, the plot that I've shown here is uh, an adjoint, an FSOI, a forecast sensitivity to observation impact plot comparing the red bars for a real, a real data set for two months and uh, our Aussie for um, uh, also two months. These are, happens to be normalized, so it's showing the fractional observation impact from these different types of observations. And you can see it's not a perfect match. 
but overall it's got pretty good relative ranking of the impacts of uh, these different observations. So clearly AMSUA is a very <laughs> impactful observation type, um, microwave sounder, and then some other types such as HERS-4, FSMIS, not so much. So when we see results like this, we have more confidence that our OSSEE results are going to be giving you um, robust information about how these observations would actually perform in the real world. So final slide here, I should admit here, I am not at all an Arctic specialist. My background is actually in tropical dynamics. Um, I have a little bit of experience looking at some Arctic issues in Aussies from a long time ago. Um, but some off the top of my head, these are some things that I expect might be of concern uh, if you're trying to do an Arctic Aussie. First of all, your nature run really needs to have realistic Arctic processes. And one thing that's been common in some of the, the global nature runs that have been available to the community is they do not tend to have interactive sea ice. The sea ice will be uh, prescribed from a previous year. The G5 nature run uses sea ice prescribed from uh, 2005 and 2006, but the synoptic conditions do not the ice does not interact at all with the synoptic conditions. So depending on what you're looking at in the Arctic, this that that's something that could have a major impact on what you're looking at. Um, you may decide that you need a coupled ocean. Um, so this all depends on the on the type of instrument and the type of question that you're looking to answer when you're doing your Aussie. You would need to consider can I get away with a prescribed SST ocean? Usually these are again, prescribed SSTs from some previous time period that may not match the synoptic situation at all. Um, an earlier, I can definitely say that an earlier version of one of the ECMDBF nature runs, which was made 15 years ago, uh, no one's really using it anymore, um, but there were definitely some, there have been issues with previous global Aussies involving the presence of Arctic clouds, the lack of presence of Arctic clouds uh, and issues with the boundary layer dynamics. Um, so these are some areas that if you were interested in looking at a nature run to use for an Aussie, you would definitely want to validate that nature run specifically for the phenomena that you are interested in observing to make sure that they behave realistically um, or possibly not. And if they don't, um, you might need to look elsewhere or try to think of how you might be able to mitigate that. Uh, snow and surface characteristics, you know, these also can be difficult. Uh, they're difficult. Sometimes these might even be somewhat prescribed. Again, it should be looked at. When you're simulating the observations, you need the Aussie to also be able to, you need the nature run to um, have realistic behavior of things that are, that affect how you make the observations. So example, AMVs, atmospheric motion vectors. Um, real atmospheric motion vectors are made using um, feature tracking in pictures, se sequential pictures of uh, clouds or water vapor. This is not possible in the Aussie because the Aussie, well, in the most Aussies because most Aussies do not have cloud resolving nature runs. So you have to use some statistical technique instead. So you need the statistics of the presence of clouds in the nature run to match the statistics of real clouds as best as possible in order to be able to simulate realistic types of, of observations that would measure those, those clouds. Um, so this type of thing can be an issue. And especially in the Arctic, um, if you're looking at radiances that might be affected by surface emissivity problems over ice and snow, um, this can be hard to deal with when you are simulating the observations, how to simulate observations that we struggle to work with uh, on a daily basis can be, a, can be a challenge. And also we've tended to find a lot of problems simulating observations over areas with significant orography. Um, Greenland uh, could, could be difficult, Antarctica could be difficult. Um, to work with just it's it's been a challenge um in the 15 years that i've been working in aussies to to get realistic behavior out of simulated observations over uh like surface observations over high terrain um 
in terms of actually performing experiments, you may need to do some development with your data assimilation in order to handle some of the observation types. If we are not, if you are interested in using some new type of observation that is very different from observations that are currently used operationally, uh, you would have to do some development of the data assimilation in order to be able to both simulate and, and assimilate into your, your model the simulated data. Um, and that can be rewarding. Um, this type of thing, if, if you have done the work in, in order to make your OSI, if you have to do a lot of work developing your data simulation, when you get real data, you've actually done a lot of the work already uh, in performing your OSI. So you get kind of a head start when you get real data, um, but it is an upfront cost uh, to performing an OSI. Um, and finally here, when you're running your experiments, you really want to have a different model for running your, your experiments than the model that was used for the nature run. And you want to have the, the ideally the difference between the nature run and your experiment model should be the same as the difference between your experiment model and the real world. Um, if you have two models which use similar parameterizations, you might not have a, enough model error um, for certain types of phenomenon, and that means it can be difficult to find impacts from your observations if your, your model is just too good. Um, it's, and it's too good just because it's too similar to the nature run. And if it's not able to accurately um, represent the, the type of difference that's, that's seen between the real world and, and our, our normal models. Um, so that hopefully was at least a brief overview. Um, I'm going to say, I guess we open the questions now. Thanks very much, Nikki. Um, I think I should say that um, we're going to have a test here of the um, uh, jargon tolerance from our, our different backgrounds here. If, you'll, if you're able to tolerate our um, Arctic jargon, uh, we'll be able to tolerate um, your Aussie acronyms, um, if that's okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to start the discussion here by drilling down on this uh, nature run uh, topic. So there are, as far as I know, there are three main nature runs. There are the two ECMWF nature runs and there are ours. Is that the full universe of, of global nature runs or are there others? Um, in terms of global nature runs, that would the 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 only ones that I'm familiar with that people have been using for this type of purpose have been um, what we call the T511, which was the ECMWF nature run that was run in 2005-2006 at T511 resolution, which is about 40-45 kilometers. The ECMWF has a newer nature run, which is run. Um, Oh, their horizontal resolution. I want to say the horizontal resolution is is around six kilometers. Um, the vertical levels, a hundred and and something vertical levels. The weakness of the newer ECMWF Nature Run is that it only has three hourly output. So when you're interpolating to make your simulated observations, you are interpolating between a long time span. Um, and so that kind of makes the effective resolution less, if you follow me there. Um, the G5 nature run has fewer, has only has 72 vertical levels. It has 30 minute output and it has um, about seven kilometer resolution. Um, these are the, the G5 nature run and the, the new ECMWF run are the two that are currently in use. They are both available through online portals and they are very, very large. Um, and um, are you aware of any uh, other OSIs or other nature runs that are being uh, considered? I've heard rumors of a coupled a uh, nature run that uh, is being constructed in the GMAO, but uh, do you know do you know anything about that? Um, there are always rumors. Um, there is a contingency that that um, there has definitely been a long-standing interest in very high resolution 
global nature runs. Um, this begins to present some technical issues um, as we move towards, let's say, two kilometers, one kilometer. Um, the data sets become extremely difficult to handle at that size. And you then need, you know, if you go to one or two kilometers, you really need to have very frequent um, available output, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes. Um, and the IO handling of the nature run becomes <laughs> is this prohibitive. extreme it, yeah. prohibitive um so currently um there, there has been the beginnings of discussion of how we're going to be treating this going forward because we will need to come up with basically a a different way of handling this that probably does not involve dumping out 500 petabytes of data and then laboriously running IO on it afterwards. Um, but this is in the er early stages of of working addressing this issue. There is some there has been some light discussion of uh, moving on to the Jedi framework. I do not have the capability of giving any details because I don't know any details. The the general framework has been, it's, the expectation is that um, some of the operators for simulating observations will probably move to that JEDI framework in the future mm -hmm. time frame, not certain. Um, but there's a lot of development is going to be need to be done. Yeah. And and so the, the truth that comes out of the nature run is really the, the main starting block, right? If there are inaccurate or if, if there are problems with the nature run, then there are going to be problems throughout the, the OSI process. Um, is that is that right? Yes. Some some things you can mitigate um, depending on what you're doing and what question you're trying to answer by look by running the OSI. Um, but you need to start with getting a nature run. <laughs> Um, a, a nature run that, that will serve your purpose. And definitely for the Arctics, I, I, I'm not sure how much evaluation has been done specifically for some of these issues, um, but it, it depends on the observing systems that you're interested in specifically and what your what types of phenomena you're you're interested in in looking at. I mean, Nobody really looks at anomaly correlation, 500 millibar anomaly correlation in the Arctic at day five, which is something that is really big in the, the latitudes. And I see there's people with their hands up and I don't know how you want to handle that. Okay, I should take a look here. Um, Ice, do you wanna ask your question? Sure, I'd be happy to. I apologize, they just started mowing the lawn on the other side of the street, so hopefully it's not too loud, but... Um, my, my question was really about the Arctic being an evolving place and um, things looking different. And I wonder to what extent anyone is aware of Aussies that have targeted observations as they might look in the future with, with a changing sea ice pack and a uh, changing atmosphere in this environment. Uh, I, I don't know if there are any thoughts about that, but it seems like, for example, with an increase in shipping in the Arctic, you'll have a lot more surface observations than you do currently. Um, is that something that people have thought about trying to replicate in these simulations? I personally am not aware of that. I would say it is something that you could certainly do, though, um, because your nature run can be whatever you want it to be. So if you wanted to make a nature run in the future, um, you could do a nature run in the future and set that up however you would like from, you know, some starting point from a climate run. Um, you know, that has an initial condition with different carbon levels, et cetera, with a different ice pack and make your nature run from that and, and go from there. And I that's actually an interesting question, I but I'm not aware of anybody who's, who's looked at that. Maybe someone else here has. Yeah, and just as a follow-up point, I guess it wasn't even as much about the actual atmospheric state in the future as it is about the observations that are being made. I mean, you could, in theory, use today's atmospheric state and simulate the observations 
as you might envision them being in a different environment, correct? Yes. Yes. Well, one, one of the challenges with Aussies, um, especially if you're looking in the near term, like, you know, five years from now, um, that's relatively easy to address. But if you're looking at 15 to 20 years from now, one factor that we really can't um, deal with in the Aussie very well is that there's going to be advances in data assimilation and advances in your modeling capability in the future. And that's something that, that you know, we can't, that's harder to simulate, you know, what exact, how, how exactly is that going to be different in the future? We don't really know. There is a tendency for pretty much every Aussie that I've ever seen to be what we call incestuous. And what this means is that your Aussie is too good. Um, the, there's not enough model error. The nature run is just ends up being a little bit too similar. Well, some degree of too similar to your your forecast model. So we don't have enough model error. And then your background state is a little bit too good. And then everything kind of cascades from there. And it makes things a little bit tricky. So in a little bit of a way, we're kind of like our, our system, if our skill scores are uh, in practice 0.88, our Aussie skill score is 0.92. Um, so our Aussie, our, even though our model is, is not the best model, uh, our Aussie model performs like the ECM degraph model. Um, so we have a little advancement uh, unwanted um, in that direction, but it's, it's, that's a difficult thing to tackle. Thank you. So I think the next question was from Charles Miller at JPL. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, I was wondering how you would handle the coupling in of the permafrost and the seasonally varying wetlands to the atmosphere in this type of simulation? If that question is for me, I have to tell you, I have absolutely no idea. I <laughs> um, am, am not at all familiar with specific Arctic processes or how they're modeling, but I, someone yeah, so else I may, this, may be able to answer that. I think this is one of the fundamental challenges is that you've been telling us a lot about global models and yet there are specific aspects of the Arctic that are really unique and have strong feedbacks on the Arctic system. Well, I think that's right. Um, I know the land surface group has, has made some effort towards putting in permafrost into the model simply by uh, deepening the, the model layers. And they've written a few papers on the representation of permafrost and in the model, but I, I certainly agree with your sentiment that these types of um, you know, small scale processes in the Arctic are probably missing from the nature run. Uh, certainly the nature run that was produced uh, six years ago. So I think that's going to be you know, an issue for these types of Aussie simulations. Um, I see David Constein has his hand up. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Nikki. I just wanted to ask about the creation of the synthetic observation uh, data sets, both, both for the instruments that you have in your observing system and maybe for the instrument that you're um, interested in adding to see what kind of effect it might have on uh, forecasts. And the question is, wouldn't you want to use real retrievals, uh, you know, run, run a real retrieval algorithm on each of those instruments and in particular on the instrument that you're interested in, uh, that you're using the Aussie to try and understand uh, rather than just kind of uh, add some noise in a sort of arbitrary and ad hoc manner. So if you could discuss that uh, a little bit, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, so I can address to a certain degree what we, the process that we use at the GMAO. Um, so what we do for the, the observation errors, um, we calibrate our observation errors to add to the, the simulated observations to match certain statistics of the behavior of the observations that we see with real data. So we try to match the observation for, for, for existing 
data types that we already use that we have real data for. So for those data, what we do is we try to match the count, so the statistical the, the count um, to roughly the same level um, in whatever distribution. So there might be you know a vertical distribution of uh, of like aircraft or, or ray obs um, where the count is different at different levels. We try to match that. Um, and then we also try to match the what's called the observation innovation, the, the O minus F, the difference between the difference between your observation and the um, the forecast, the background state moved into observation space. So we look at the O minus F and we add two types of error. We do add a random error, which is just an uncorrelated random error. And then for many, but not all observation types, we add a correlated error because real observations have correlations. So um, depending on the type, we may add a vertical correlated error to a sounding type, um, channel correlated error to a hyperspectral radiance type, um, horizontal error to um, AMVs or certain other non-hyperspectral uh, non radiance types, AMSU-A, for example. And we try to match the, the spatial correlation of real observations to the spatial correlation of the syn synthetic observations. So this gets and ends up getting kind of tricky because one issue, as I said, the, the neutrons lit too good. So if we match precisely the error that we see with real data, we can overcompensate. Um, we may be adding too much error um, to try to force the system to be more different, but we can't change the forecast error, so we change the observation error, and we don't want to deviate that too much. So there's a little bit of an art in there to not overdoing it um, while not having a completely unrealistic system. So this is how we handle things um, in-house at GMAO. And I'm, I'm, your question was about retrievals. Um, I know that we we generally don't work with retrievals um, at GMAO just because our our NWP the data simulation system the GSI uh, in just radiances so we work with radiances but I do know that the group at JPL uh, there's a group at JPL who's been doing Aussies using um, retrievals so I don't know if that answers your question um, but someone at JPL might be able to answer that question better than I. Um, well, I, 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 I guess I, I would just, uh, I, th I would think that you would want to include sort of a, a realistic, it, it didn't sound to me like what you were doing was, um, uh, trying to reproduce the radiances that a realistic instrument would uh, would measure when you're actually doing this this process that you've described, but it does seem like you spent a little more time thinking about or, or, or adjusting how you represent the observations than I had first thought. So um, anyway, um, uh, I, I'm wondering also if you could ask answer another question. Um, does this this fact that things are maybe a little bit too error free uh, uh, have anything to do with the lack of, uh, or could it be fixed if you used stochastic parameterizations in the model rather than uh, a non-stochastic approach? Thanks. Yeah. So. There are some different ways that you can attempt to to fix or at least alleviate the problem of having the system that's too good. And one of them is to change the parameterizations. Um, we have done that a little bit. I don't think we I don't think we've used tried using any stochastic parameterizations. Um, we've mostly worked with selecting different choices that were available. Um, so, for example, 
um, there are two choices of microphysics, uh, a, a single moment and a two moment. So we, the nature run happens to use the single moment. And so we've tried using the, the two moment of different microphysics uh, in order specifically, the only reason to do this for us was specifically to try to increase the amount of model error that we had. And we've tried changing certain other parameterizations. So for, for us in-house, we have a little bit of a sticky situation because we are working with a nature run that we made with our same model. This is a fraternal twin, Aussie. They're also, if you use exactly the same model to make your nature run and do your experiment, it's called an identical twin. If you use related, but not precisely the same models, it's called fraternal twin. So we have a, a fraternal twin system in-house, which is not ideal. Um, our, our preference would be to have it be less similar. Um, so going, you know, going forward, we try to introduce as many different parameterizations as we can to, to try to stretch this difference between the nature run and our model. Well, at the same time, we don't want to we use something explicitly terrible. We like you could try to break your forecast model or or your nature run to make them less good, but it's it's not a, a great solution. It's it, there isn't a, a great solution, but yeah, damaging your forecast model is is less than ideal. So uh, Kelly Ulig uh, wrote a question in the chat. Uh, what would it take to create an Arctic regional nature run? So Nikki, you had indicated uh, the complexities in, in producing a nested um, nature run. I guess you, you had indicated that you would need to nest it within a existing nature run. What were the other uh, complexities? Yeah. So. So there, there are two choices that you can do if you want to do a regional Aussie. The hard choice in my recommendation here is that I am aware of one group that has done the hard choice successfully, and that is NOAA AOML has nested a, a high resolution hurricane model inside of one of the global nature runs. I think they used the T511. They may have updated this, I, I'm not sure, but they spent a lot of effort. They have several publications. Uh, if you're interested, you can read about what they did um, and look it up. They have a little challenge because the hurricanes move, so they have a moving nest. Um, you don't have that problem, I presume, in the Arctic, it stays put. Um, so you, you do have an issue um, with the regional na nature runs if you want to go the hard route um, of integrating a regional nature run inside of the global nature run. Um, I have never tried doing this, um, but there can be some issues with the, the boundary. I, I know that with the AOML group that they initially had problems that the hurricane in their nested model would go in a different direction than the hurricane in the global model. And that was not so great. Um, it took them a while. To, I, they did eventually succeed, um, but I think they initially had some problems with that. Um, I'm not sure if there would be any similar issues to that in the Arctic, it can depend on the size of the regional model, the, the domain size for, for your regional model. Um, the, common, the common choice that you will find frequently in the literature um, is not to do that, is to take a regional model, usually uh, the wharf is very popular, um, and run the, make yourself a, a, a short, a short nature run, um, usually just a couple days long, um, that starts from a real forecast and you run it just for five days a week, um, depending on your domain size. And just, you, you're basically forced to run a case study. Um, if you go that direction, it's much simpler. Um, because you don't have to do this, this full nesting procedure, but you become much more limited in the kinds of experiments that you can do because you are forced to use a very short time. Um, you may, if you are doing that, it may be possible to use some real observation, maybe depending on how similar your nature is, run is. Um, usually, 
I tend to see experiments of that type coming from uh, universities uh, where they may not have the resources needed to, to run a full blown full blown Aussie. Just it, it's a very expensive development process, um, especially, for example, the radiance data. Uh, we simulate the radiance data using the CRTM uh, rate of transfer model. Um, and it's it's resource intensive. Um, so sometimes people choose to do a regional OSI and a quick type OSI where you just run for a couple of days and they may use a, a reduced data set. Um, for example, not using any radiances at all. Um, in this, proceed with caution. Uh, you, you, depending on the question that you're trying to ask, you may be able to get useful results from an experiment of this type is you need to be very careful um, in performing it um, and not take too many shortcuts, let me put it that way, uh, in your setup. So I think I'm obligated to give the GMAO uh, answer to this question, which is the focus on the G and that the, the global models should be incorporating more Arctic processes uh, into their the representation. And I think we've been working hard to do that with improved representations over the, um, the ice sheets, uh, improved cloud representations. I, I think that the uh, NWP model is hindered because it's an AGCM model, and so it doesn't have that realistic representation of the sea ice. But I think that's a coupled uh, data analysis system is is coming, and it's already part of our um, you know our seasonal forecasting system. So so I think you know uh, better better nature runs are probably in the works. I guess I would say I would suggest that. I, I think my suggestion for a global, in the interest of, if you're, if you're interested in doing global nature runs, I would engage with the community that starts making the decisions about these nature runs um, to make sure that the processes that you want, if you are interested in doing Aussies, you know, um, there are only a couple players out there in the making big global Aussies business. I mean, make the big global nature runs business and inquire, express your interest. Um, and you would need to decide the processes that you, you would want to see represented, um, the physics that you want to see. Um, and also be sure that the, um, the output variables that you want are going to be available um, just because with these large data sets, sometimes they may decide not to save as much as you would want um, for making observations. There, there, there may be decisions made about how much output to save, and you would want to be in on that decision-making process to make sure that the, the variables that you want to see, that you're interested in, get saved at the resolutions and frequencies that you want to look at. Um, so that they're available to you. So in the chat, uh, Chudun Zhang uh, writes, long time fully coupled Arctic regional model run would be too challenging to produce realistic Arctic. Sh a short run may not need uh, coupled sea ice and ocean. Um, I think in general, the, the nature runs though are you know just a year and a half or two years to simulate the seasonal cycle. Isn't that, isn't that right, Nikki? Um, yeah, the G5 nature run is two years. I'm honestly not entirely sure if the new EC nature run is one year or, or if it's longer than that. Honestly, when we run Aussies, the process is very, it's uh, making the data is intensive, running the experiments is intensive. So we generally, when we're doing a test on a new data system, we have a one month spin up period for spinning up the Aussie system and for doing calibration and validation. And then we have a two month period where that we run for experiments. Um, we have been using this for a long time and you tend to be able for most instrument types to get statistically significant results out of a two month time period with a global instrument. Um, so you're running an, if you wanted to run an, an Aussie for a long period of time for that full two years, that would be very, very expensive 
proposition if you're especially if you're in terms of making the observations and in also in terms of actually running it and looking at the results unless you wanted to run at a very a very low resolution um, which most people don't really want to do that are there any other questions from the uh, collaborative team leaders or any of the other participants. Richard, just a comment from my side, you know, as you know, we um, tried very hard to find multiple speakers for this session and it was actually somewhat surprising to me that we weren't able to successfully do so. So I really appreciate Nikki coming forward. Um, and even though she says she's not an Arctic expert uh, providing us with what I thought was a really useful and interesting um, seminar here. I, I guess as a general statement, it seems almost crazy to me that there aren't additional um, efforts underway in the Arctic where there are many questions about observing and what's useful from a weather and from a climate perspective. So I think, um, I, don't, I don't know how to best focus future efforts on this topic, but um, it, it would be really great to find out whether we really did um, scrape the barrel here or whether there are other groups that are active and um, that maybe we just missed uh, and better understand, you know, what, what other groups are doing, because it seems it seems almost um, just in, incredible to me that we had so much difficulty on this important topic. I agree, but um, I think that that might be associated with the inherent difficulties of doing this for the Arctic. Um, yeah. <laughs> it is, there's a lot of groups doing hurricane Aussies. We don't do that in-house, but there's a lot of hurricane Aussies out there. Um, like 60, 70% of Aussies are <laughs> practically hurricane Aussies um, when, when you include all the regional models. So yeah, I, I really, I can't think of any, I've been doing this 15 years and I can't think of anybody who's actually done a, a Arctic specific Aussie. Um, not that I couldn't have missed it, but it's, it's. Okay, I think that'll wrap it up. Um, thanks very much again, uh, Nikki, for, for presenting and, and taking our questions. Um, Drew, is there any other housekeeping that needs to be done? Um, I think the only bit of housekeeping, um, well, as a plug for the Atmosphere team, we will be holding our next meeting on September 28th at 11 a.m. Um, sorry, 11 a.m. Alaska time, 3 p.m. Eastern time on clouds and reanalysis. Um, that's just a plug for our team. However, this meeting will be re is recorded and will be available on the Arabic YouTube website. Okay. I think that's it for me. I'd like to thank everyone for participating and, and joining us in this talk. I think it was very useful. Thanks very much again to Nikki and thanks very much for everyone else. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.